I don't think I have this in, in order, but I'll start from um, my left, your right. So we have uh, Marianne Beckadal, who is president of Advertiser Solutions from AgKeeper. Um, we have, um, well, I'll just read off the screen, Richard Hartel, executive vice president, managing director, human experience strategy at MediaVest. Ben Kartzman, who is CEO and founder of SpongeCell. Chris Scoggins, who's Senior Vice President, General Manager, DLX Platform for Data Logics, and Nate Woodman, who's Chief Operating Officer of AdMedic. Okay, so by the way, just to add to Ken's offer for uh, free drinks later, there'll also be free aspirins for anybody who wants them. That was actually the perfect setup for a man versus machine discussion. Um, so as Steve, as Steve pointed out when we started the uh, day, you know, We've done a couple of things with OMA Display when we made the transition from OMA AdNets. Um, one was that we wanted to really elevate the discussion about um, premium display, but also, you know, kind of how human beings and users experience online display advertising, because we thought maybe we were getting a little, way, a little bit away from that with all of the focus on technology. And if you read the blurb for this panel, I, you know, I love all the acronyms we spawn, you know. DSP and RTB and everything, and we kind of lost sight of the UX, which people in the media design world, you know, know means user experience, or as Mr. Hartel would say, you know, human experience. Because sometimes we lose sight and forget that in the end, this stuff is about connecting human beings to human beings. Um, so um, that's kind of the setup here, and I imagine um, there's going to be some tension between people and machines, but what I'd like to um, do is just start off with some opening comments about what you do and what your innate position is on uh, kind of which is better, man or machine. We'll just do that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Marianne Beckadal of AdKeeper. Uh, we're a new company that lets consumers keep ads for later, so we're big fans of the old marketing <coughs> philosophy of right message, right place, right time. So I think machines do one third of that. I think they do right place pretty well. Uh, but I think the right message has to be done by brilliant creative minds. And there's lots of panels on that these days. Um, and I think humans themselves have to determine what the right time is, which is where AdKeeper comes in. Um, but I do think that machines do an awesome job of helping advertisers figure out where to put their uh, campaigns, but that those campaigns have to connect, have to be beautiful, and have to reach the consumer when they want to engage. Thank you. Richard? Um, so Richard Hartel, um, I have a ridiculously long title, as you can see, and um, um, I'll explain the middle bit of it, which is um, my role is to kind of bring in a bit of a human element, so it's not about kind of um, consumer or customer experience, it's about human experience, so it's the idea that um, in a kind of world of lots and lots of uh, kind of um, communications, too many communications, too many products, too many things out there, you've actually got to remember about how human beings kind of interact with brands and also how, interact, uh, how they interact with one another. Now that's a really important part of the whole communication process. So kind of my thing is about trying to get um, my agency um, to kind of remember the kind of human element of what we do as an organization, um, while at the same time recognizing there's lots of other things like, like machines which help what we do, but making sure that we stay in touch with human beings and stay in touch with what really kind of um, can affect a human be being around communication and around a brand. So my kind of position, as you'd imagine, from this um, talk is going to be more about kind of how human beings can make a big difference to communications. Um, ben Kartzman, I'm the CEO of SpongeCell. We are an interactive ad technology company that takes rich media-like functionality and injects it into standard display ads. Um, my take on you know, man versus machine is, so I, I have a background in human-computer interaction, and that is really all about understanding how man perceives machine, processes machine, and then takes action based on what machine shows them. So for me, um, there obviously are elements of technology that are critical to, you know, getting the right message out or, you know, having it happen at the, at the right time and, and in the right place. Uh, but it certainly has to be a blend with something that a human uh, wants to interact with, that a human wants to um, connect to. Uh, you know, it just can't be something that's 
uh, arbitrary or can't be something that is, you know, the last item that I purchased and I'd already purchased it, so why are you showing me an ad for an item I've already purchased? It needs to, machine needs to be a lot smarter than that. Chris? Yeah, Chris Scoggins. Uh, I run the digital data business at Data Logics. Um, so we are a data and analytics company. So we try to build tools using offline purchase data to make digital marketers more efficient and effective with, with their spend. And so my point of view on this is just how do we build applications and tools that the humans can actually use, right? Because I agree machines can't do this on their own, but um, I think as we make this industry more and more efficient, uh, it will allow people to spend more of their time on truly the value added um, ta tasks at hand and less of kind of the, the rote tasks that probably should be automated, which I think makes at the end of the day the marketing spend um, more effective and better. <coughs> Uh, my name is Nathan Woodman. I'm the CEO of Adnetic. Adnetic's a, a technology company that specializes in uh, t buying targeted media. Um, my opinion on the man versus machine is that uh, we do a lot of work in the real-time bidding space. And you know, what we see a lot is that we have machines interacting with machines. And uh, when you get to machines interacting with machines, you end up with a lot of uh, nuance. And you end up, it almost becomes a game. So we see a lot of, you know, we see humans on one side, you know, tweaking things to play the game one way, and we see humans on the other side tweaking their machines to play the game the other way. So um, as much as real-time bidding is about automation, you know, what we end up, you know, continuously coming back to is the fact that there are human controllers, and those human controllers set the strategy. And uh, that's my point of view on this one. Well, that's great. You, used the, you actually used the word human controllers? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if, you know, if I was actually going to seat this as a spectrum, I would have put Richard here and I would have put you over there because I think we have kind of a spectrum going here. And um, I love the fact that you're all about, you know, exploring, you know, the human experience. And, you know, I kind of poked fun when Richard got his new title. But, you know, I, I want to apologize that I am a jerk. But uh, I thought it was ironic that we were starting to use that word because it's the ultimate word to explain what we do as an industry, which is we're really fundamentally about human beings. Um, and I'm going to guess this is the first time you've ever been on a panel about like ad display technology? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have Marianne who's really about a technology that enables cons you humans, you know, the end humans, the consumers, to manipulate their media better, you know, in a way that's more relevant for them. And then we have Dan who's created a technology that lets humans create and serve better human experiences on these technology platforms. And then we have you guys who are allowing human beings, professional trade people, to have better, more efficient ways of targeting those end humans, end user human beings. Um, you know, the one participant we weren't able to get on this panel, and I don't think it was fair, was an actual machine. So, you know, we did invite Watson, but he apparently was already engaged with a game show somewhere. So, um, but we, we did actually, we, we thought we'd actually ask Siri a couple of questions because, um, this is the first time I'm using uh, an iPhone, believe it or not. Um, okay, so Siri, I uh, hope you don't mind if, um, you know, we have this debate going on on man versus machine, and we'd just like to ask a few questions. So I'm going to start off here. So which is better, man or machine? Which question. is better, man or machine? Sorry, I'm not feeling very decisive today. She said, I'm sorry, but I'm not feeling very decisive today. <laughs> okay. Um, which is better, art or science? She can't decide. Um, all right, I'll just do two more. Okay. Um, do you know Hal 9000? I 
I'd rather not talk about how, but if you must. I'd rather not talk about how, but if you must. Okay, and last one. When will machines enslave us? <laughs> one second. Let me check that for you. Oh, she found a website for it. Okay, thank you, Siri. Goodbye. Um, I, I'm, that was just a visual way of making a point. Um, the real point here is I don't think anybody would disagree on this panel that um, technology could be a great enabler for people, especially given what we just saw from Stephen Kim and the amount of data and volume and stuff we're processing as human beings. That last you know, example he, he gave actually kind of made me a little nauseous thinking about the number of variables that we can compute and put together as people. But you guys are challenged as an industry now. You have to make real-time decisions <coughs> around this data. So my real question to you is, how do you keep the human element in it? How do you keep the human element in it when the data can fly faster than human beings can think? And I'll just throw it out there. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I think that the human element, you, you have to put stuff in front of people um, that they want. So we can leverage all, as much data as we want from uh, machines to create different creative on the fly and serve different types of interactivity in front of people on the fly and make decisions and leverage some you know, past or behavioral data to influence those decisions. But at the same time, if you're putting something in front of a consumer that um, is intrusive or is uh, something that they don't want to uh, experience or interact with, doesn't really matter what the, what the message says. So I think a lot of it is in the, the delivery. And if you can get the delivery right, then that gives you the opportunity you know, as a brand to uh, put the right message or at least the, the, the most optimal message that you think you can you know, in front of that consumer. I mean, certainly the idea that um, I mean, it'll be funny, right, in, in three years to have a panel like this where we're talking about, um, you know, getting the right message or making sure all messages are localized or making sure that, you know, we're doing the right sequential messaging. I think that's the stuff that is going to become, uh, it's just going to become standard. And the only way that becomes standard is, um, you know, as platforms like we're all building, um, you know, get built out and just make it easier uh, and more efficient. So, you know, ultimately, if you can, if you can create the, uh, the vehicle that a consumer wants to see, then it becomes a lot easier to leverage all the technology that's out there, um, you know, to, to leverage some machine elements uh, in terms of the creation and, and delivery of messages. Okay, so when I started covering this business, I, I thought it was like Wall Street. It was like the financial marketplace. You had people buying and selling equities and commodities and, you know, real, real people. And over time, I always thought that technology would eventually transform our marketplace because it was a very clubby kind of human being to human being process. And I gave up a long time ago thinking when the network up front would go away and, you know, people don't drink three martinis anymore, but they're basically still human interactions. At the same time, this marketplace has emerged because there was a real need. There was all this inventory. You guys have done a masterful job of creating connections for that inventory. My question is, how long before the industry really flips to this kind of technological oriented marketplace as the dominant factor? You know, real time bidding or buying, real time planning. And where are going to be the controls and the checks and balances in that? We've seen with Wall Street now, you know, the SEC has actually regulated, you know, controls now for when markets move too fast. You know, there are stops that are put on um, things like that. So. I'd just like to throw that, start with you guys, and maybe then come back to the human beings. Yeah. Um, so I think, the, I mean, you're asking a, a human to predict the future, right? <laughs> There's a, you know, when, we, we, when might we see this transition? And, you know, my opinion is that, um, my opinion since the start is that real-time bidding, it's ultimately, it's the auction marketplace is benefits the publisher, right? But what really benefits the advertiser and the buyer is the transparency and the control, okay? So, um, my point, of, my point of view on this is that it flips when publishers get what they want out of it, right? Which is in essence higher yield and higher pricing, um, which should inevitably happen. It's just not where it is right now. 
um, but it's just if you just follow the logic and you just follow the fact that um, if you are able to set up these types of programmatic buying inserts into publishers um, and allow the controller or the ad buyer to, you know, to pull the inventory they want and the publisher gets the yield that they don't, everybody saves money. There's less, there's less friction in the environment. So I think right now it's just it's a stalemate. I mean, it's a chicken and egg, and it's just a matter of uh, getting uh, good inventory uh, into the system, but there's some reluctance uh, just because of the state of the uh, disequilibrium in the market. Yeah, the, um, my, my background's in econometrics, which is the confluence of math and economics. And so I see the kind of technology layer is mainly around price discovery. And this industry has been, any industry that's been human to human for a long time, and this has been for decades, there's really, you don't really know is, is something I'm buying worth $5 or $10 or $15. And so technology is really good at helping solve that problem. And so when you get a lot of people on a market buying and selling something, you really get quickly get to what's the true value of this, this object at some point in time. And that tends to benefit somebody over, you know, it, it, someone in the past had a, had a little bit of a surplus they were extracting and someone was overpaying and now that's more transparent. So that overall in markets, that tends to be a good thing. Um, I think the buy side of this business has tended to use technology and data more aggressively. What I've seen in the last five years is probably the scales probably tilted in that direction. I also sit on the board of a company called Yieldex, which is a company that helps publishers try to understand and price properly their premium inventory. So now publishers are really trying to take advantage of this technology too. And, and it's, it's interesting because it, like, like Nate said, it kind of raises, it, we're at a little bit of a stalemate now, stal stalemate now but it, it should raise the bar for everyone. And really good creative content should rise up to the top, both the content and then the actual advertisement as well. And people that are really good at targeting the right um, the right audience at the right time should make their marketing budget more effective. Because at the end of the day, that's what, I mean, marketers spend a couple hundred billion dollars in the U.S. to get people to buy stuff. At the end, and that's kind of what, what all we do. And so marketers want to spend less money and have them buy the same amount of stuff, or they want to spend the same amount of money and have them buy more stuff. So all this technology and stuff should help do that. And if it doesn't, we're all kind of just, you know... There's no point. Okay, so the systems do work because there's a behavior that comes in at the end, a human behavior. People bought stuff or didn't buy stuff. But my big question is, did we do the right thinking about what drives the behaviors in the first place? Or is it just algorithms, you know, modeling behavior, predictive modeling, outcomes? And they work, but how do we know if the right impetus went in in the first place? And I don't know, maybe throw it to, to you guys a little bit to see what you think about that. Well, I was going to say that I, um, you know, it's the same thing. You kind of you need to make sure you've got the inputs right in the beginning. If you get that wrong, so if you haven't got a kind of a decent human understanding at the beginning that you set up the right parameters, that you will end up, you know, real time bidding against completely the wrong thing, and then you, and then you're just wasting kind of your money in just in the same way you would have done if it was a human to human kind of um, trading process where you've got no transparency and visibility. So if you don't set it up right in the first place. You, you're going to have a big mess. And then the other thing is the real-time bidding piece, I think there needs to be care over that as well because you can actually end up um, discounting kind of longer-term trends if you've just always got your eye on the kind of immediate real-time action and behavior uh, and, and not see some of the bigger things that are going on. So that requires some kind of really strong analytic skills in there and it, you know, to, to, to continue to optimize against the right thing. Um, but on the flip side, I think you need some kind of new types of creative skills that can also then not just be optimizing, but can take things to kind of a bigger level and change things fundamentally. So, you know, you've always got to have that human input going throughout the process. And if you miss out on that, then while there's tons of efficiencies in um, the whole um, real-time bidding and demand-side platforms, tons of efficiencies, and it did update quite a kind of our antiquated system and is still in the process of doing so, you still need human interventions continuously throughout the process. Actually, if I could follow up on that, I mean, this is one of my concerns about the industry right now. I think, you know, people always said it's content king, it's conduit king. I really think data has become king in our industry recently. And your job is to look at data from that most, you know, efficient data to the most, 
essential human data. I assume you're still involved in focus groups and communication studies and things. Which one is winning in your process, the really front end, high level thinking? Which one is becoming the more dominant? Well, it's kind of, I don't want to sound like a cop out, but it is both. It is both. And what I think is most exciting about a lot of the data is a lot of uh, media research and knowledge was all um, claimed behaviours. It was all attitudes and claimed behaviours. What's good about a lot of the data now is it's real behaviour, and real behaviour is a much better indicator of what people think and feel and do than anything they claim to do. So that stuff's great. But what it doesn't tell you, what behaviour doesn't tell you, is why. Why did they do that? Why did they take that particular action? And if you dig, are able to dig deep into the why, then you can blow it up into a much bigger thing because you understand the fundamental reason that sits behind it, which you can then scale beyond a tiny, inf a tiny efficiency that exhibits itself through a behavior. So it has to be both. But what um, the new data really provides is a great behavioral kind of platform on which to then put qualitative understanding on top. Okay, so Marianne and Dan, you have platforms that allow um, professionals to look at another kind of human behavior. Um, what kind of insights have you learned from people bookmarking and keeping their own advertising? And what kind of insights have you learned from what kind of creative is resonating with users that might be informative and instructive to the trading systems, basically? So it's interesting, the whole discussion and something you mentioned in our notes in advance, this industry is growing, digital media, digital marketing, digital spend should continue to grow if it's going to match consumer time spend. Um, you alluded to Wall Street, right? So interesting new skills coming into our industry. I, uh, I forget what you said your background was, um, but it's kind of like revenge of the nerds. I was a math major and now I'm in advertising. Um, so it's interesting to see some of these um, traders and the mentality of arbitrage moving uptown, so to speak, from Wall Street to Madison Ave. Um, I love the human element of it, and at AdKeeper we're seeing, it's really simple. People who keep ads spend more time with those ads later. It's an awesome, when we have the real-time flow of data available, we're still in beta, it will be an awesome tool for the guys at the end of the, of the panel here to help make those decisions, automated decisions. Did someone keep an ad off of site X or site Y? The person who kept off of site X, what did they do with the ad later? Did they redeem, fulfill, convert, et cetera? So that's gonna be an awesome tool when the data flows. So what have you learned? Do, do people act differently about the advertising when they have that control? I mean, yeah, we've done, um, we've done some initial studies just kind of more on the human side, more on the, um, uh, the um, awareness of the K button, the keep button on the ad itself. 23% of people feel better about the brand when there's a keep button on the ad. Um, and that's, you know, kind of across different kinds of ads. Um, and the notion being, hey, this a lot of the testimonials are fantastic. Hey, this advertiser respects me. Wow, they respect my time. Wow, they're putting me in control. So hmm. we love that. It's an emotional component. Yeah, yeah. so, we, so we've, we've done a good job of getting at the actual behavior to your point. They're spending more time, they're spending more time with ads once they've kept them and they're clicking through at a much higher rate. So consumers like the idea of time shifting. Then we went out and did the uh, um, kind of behavioral research and said, we think about this brand, we think about this advertiser, and overwhelmingly, no negative, a little bit of confusion, because it's new behavior, and 23% saying, wow, I like that brand for putting me in control. Ben, what, what have you learned about dynamic, real-time advertising and how it influences humans? Sure, so, I mean, a lot of what we've seen, uh, we've done a couple different types of studies, so I'll, and I'll go through a, a couple. So one is uh, where we measured um, our ads were rich, interactive ads with things like video, smart mapping, social feeds, et cetera, uh, versus your sort of standard uh, flash, which is still uh, static image and standard flash ads are still the predominant uh, ads on a percentage basis that are run uh, across the web. So from a brand performance perspective, uh, we outperform those those standard ads across all of the sort of core uh, brand metrics based on some brand study data uh, that we ran. Um, some other stuff that we that we've done and that we've seen is um, by localizing our ad units, which effectively means uh, in real time taking in DMA data and then showing. Um, the right content to that consumer. So if it's an auto example, uh, the content in that ad obviously changes based on where you're seeing it. 
uh, and that ad will tell you to visit your you know, local dealer and it'll show you a different car and a different price point with a different APR. Uh, you'll also have an opportunity to um, see a dealer near you, IP targeted based on um, you know, your IP and then, and then a map that shows up with uh, the dealers that are near you where you can schedule test drives, download information, and doing all of that self-contained uh, within a unit uh, we actually had one advertiser, one odd advertiser measure the efficacy of doing all that inside of a unit versus going into a web page and then trying to do all of that stuff. And the percentage was like, you know, not 1,800% or some silly number um, where more people obviously engaged inside that unit because they never had to leave. It never con covered any content. It sort of stayed within their, uh, their, their human expectations of what they wanted out of that ad unit. They actually didn't even have to click on that ad to get all of that information uh, that they wanted. They were able to do that um, just by hovering over the ad uh, for a certain time or slowing the mouse down within the ad. So it's really those human elements, and, and that's where the sort of the human factors piece of it becomes so critical, right? All the stuff that went on behind the scenes to make that ad happen doesn't really matter to the consumer. It matters to the agency and the creative agency because they want it done, they want it fast, it's gotta be perfect, they want all the, um, all the data around its performance, and they get all of that with, with the platform. But the consumer just sees this localized ad that they don't have to click on because people hate clicking on ads, as we know, um, and they can get all of that deep interaction um, you know, that, they're, that they're hopefully looking for. Ben, or anybody, um, do any of you think that consumers, humans, are changing in terms of their expectations that they maybe are becoming more tolerant and or less tolerant of not smart media, that they expect media to be more intelligent and serve them what they want at that moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they are. I think they kind of, I think um, people are generally intolerant of irrelevant messages at the wrong time, you know, because they're kind of used to, um, they're starting to get a real understanding that they're being followed, if you like, and if they're being followed badly, you know, they'll, they'll react to that. And I think, um, you know, that's why you know, if the machines are kind of not doing their job properly, they're actually doing far, far more damage than, than they kind of, than they would be. But if you get it right, then, then someone will very much welcome your message. So, but I think, yes, they are becoming more aware, completely. Do any of you think it's weird that we're talking about this now? I mean, that this is like all those science fiction stories we grew up reading and stuff, and that we're actually, okay. Um, so, one human being we haven't talked about